The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. What is Islam? Who is Muhammad? What do Muslims believe? Is the Quran the inspired Word of God? Are Christianity and Islam compatible? Can they agree? Can they coincide and coexist? These are some of the questions that we will explore in this seminar. But let's begin by talking for just a moment about the worldwide impact of Islam. You realize that Islam is expanding and impacting the world. And it might surprise you to learn that the largest Muslim populations on the planet are not in the Middle East. In fact, the most populated Muslim country is Indonesia. That's Southeast Asia. And that's followed by Pakistan, which at one time was part of India. If we were to look at a chart showing the religious complexion of the world, we would find that Christianity continues to be the number one religion of the world with over 2 billion adherents, keeping in mind that that term Christian applies to a wide range of those who profess belief in Christ in the Christian religion, about half of those being Catholic. Notice that we have about a billion Hindus on the planet. And that's followed by about a billion atheists, unbelievers, secularists, humanists, uh, those who claim to be irreligious, they have no religion whatsoever. A little over another billion consisting of Buddhism and other um, oriental type religions. That makes Islam the number two religion on the planet with about 1.3 billion adherents. If you were to take a look at the ethnicity of Muslims in the United States, you would find that only about 25% are Arab with the majority being of South Central Asian origin. Well, some have suggested that this is one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing religions in the United States. Indeed, Islam is making extensive encroachments into American culture. Are you aware of the fact that the U.S. Post Office over a decade ago uh, designed and implemented a postage stamp that is designed to commemorate two different uh, aspects of Islamic uh, celebration. Are you aware of the fact that mosques uh, for several decades now have been springing up all over the United States from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast? Uh, these mosques include, of course, the one that is planned and uh, in the process in New York City at Ground Zero. So well over a thousand mosques have been built in the United States just within the last, shall we say, 30 to 40 years. Interesting concept. Why suddenly now? And I believe the answer to that is because for the first 150 to 170 years of America's existence, American values were intact based upon the Bible and the Christian worldview. But post-World War II years have been turbulent morally, spiritually, culturally, socially. And consequently, there's been an upheaval as many Americans are jettisoning their uh, values, what were called traditional American values that were rooted in and based upon a Christian worldview. And notice as you uh, shove away from your society, from your uh, population, Bible values, then certainly there is a void created and there will be those who will rush in in order to fill that void. And consequently, Islam and other world religions that are non-Christian in orientation have been infiltrating American civilization. Think in the news how often you are hearing of these encroachments. For example, New York Public Schools uh, made room for Ramadan celebration among many of their students. Uh, Ramadan is being taught in public schools all over our country, recognized and and actually incorporated into the uh, curriculum. There have been uh, major universities across the country that have installed prayer rooms for Muslim students. They wouldn't do anything like that uh, for Christian students. Uh, the Kansas City Airport some time ago installed uh, foot baths for Muslim cabbies and 
there's even been a Muslim public school that has been funded by taxpayer money. So this infiltration, this alteration of the complexion of American civilization is taking place before our very eyes. On September 25th, 2009, several thousand Muslims gathered on the lawn of our capital in order to engage in Islamic prayers. So, massive expansion of Islam into American civilization. What is this religion that has become essentially the second largest religion in the world? Well, to answer that question, you will have to go back to the 6th century AD, when in the city of Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, if you were to look at a map of the Arabian Peninsula, you would see along the coast of the Red Sea, the town of Mecca, Muhammad's birth city. There Muhammad was born in 570 A.D. Do you know that uh, his father died, actually, before he was born? And his mother died when he was but six years old. He was turned over to the care of first his grandfather, who later died and then uh, passed from uncle to uncle. He, he grew up in Saudi Arabia like a typical Bedouin child, Bedouin boy, uh, tending goats and sheep. He learned uh, the weapons of war. He, he traveled with kinsmen on trading expeditions, which would have exposed him to a broader segment of society even beyond the borders of Arabian society. When Muhammad was 25 years old, he met a woman who invited him to take responsibility for one of her caravans. She was a wealthy widow woman, uh, which he agreed to do, and he so conducted himself in such a, a fine, trustworthy fashion that ultimately she offered herself in marriage to Muhammad. Her name was Kadja. She was 15 years his senior, 40 years old at the time he was 25. And consequently, this uh, kind of opened up a new life for Muhammad. He had more leisure time. He was able to engage in, in activities that enabled him to be more contemplative and to enjoy the respite of vacation time. Looking at a NASA satellite view of Mecca, you can see that this is a very rugged uh, desert uh, area of the earth. And we are informed by historians that in the year A.D. 610, at the age of 40 years old, Muhammad was out away from Mecca, up in a mountain range, uh, kind of uh, getting away from public life. And he uh, was actually at Mount Hira. And while he was there, he noticed a sort of an opening in the rock, a cave that he decided to go into in order to escape the intense heat of the desert. And he claims that while he was in that cave, the angel Gabriel appeared to him and delivered to him a revelation from God, the first of 114 revelations over the next 23 years, which then were assembled together after his death to form Al-Quran, which in Arabic means the reading or the recitation, that which is recited orally. And that is in fact the origin of the Quran according to Islamic history. If you were to take the Quran and begin reading it and work your way through these separate and distinct revelations called in the Quran surahs. One of the first things you would notice, especially in the early ones, that the subject matter seems to be primarily focused upon denouncing Arab idolatry and condemning Arab polytheism. You see, you have to know something of Arab tribal life at this point in history. Uh, most of the Arab tribal groups are very tribal-oriented, very blood-kin-oriented. Uh, they were very polytheistic, believed in many gods. Consequently, the Quran stressed the concept of monotheism and condemned the belief in many gods. Well, as soon as Muhammad began to express those views to his fellow Meccans, I assure you, hostilities commenced. You see, his hometown tribal group, of which he was a member, known as the Quraysh, were known peninsula-wide 
as the keepers of the Kaaba. What is the Kaaba? If you were to go to Mecca today, you would see this amazing cube-like structure that Muslims claim, though it existed at the very beginning of time, built by Adam, was later destroyed in the flood. And then they believe that God commissioned Abraham and his son Ishmael to rebuild the Kaaba together. And then God ordered pilgrimage to be made to Mecca and to that location, a minimum of annually, by those who believed in Islam. But... Muslims believe that since Abraham's day, over the centuries, the Kaaba became corrupted in its use and began to be used for idolatrous purposes. In fact, there were idols that were literally placed there. And consequently, Muhammad saw himself as having the responsibility to condemn this idolatry and to try to put a stop to polytheism. Well, his insistence upon monotheism placed him in direct conflict with the very foundation of the local economy which depended heavily upon polytheism because the Quraysh were the ones who were responsible for drawing Arabs from all over the peninsula to Mecca in order to engage in these idolatrous observances. So hostilities began to be directed against Muhammad and they began to intensify as he began to have some success. Uh, for example, he began to make converts, initially primarily among young people and slaves. And yet with that kind of growing influence, he was perceived as a greater threat than he had been initially. And this uh, opposition to Muhammad continued to intensify and grow until he was eventually forced to flee for his life from his hometown of Mecca. Consequently, he fled to the north where a group uh, of individuals had embraced his thinking, a little band of Muslims. Uh, they had already embraced Islam, and so uh, they invited him to come and to live with them. And so he took about a 12-day camel ride to the north to the city of Medina. Again, looking at a NASA satellite photo, you can see also a very deserty, rugged part of the world. But notice from the air how you can see this very visible, very obvious uh, object that uh, appears in the very center of Medina. In fact, at nighttime it stands out. Well, this is in fact the Mosque of the Prophet, it is called. It is the mosque that Muhammad began to have built during his lifetime. In fact, uh, there is a portion there that has a green dome where he is actually buried. Uh, this amazing mosque, of course, has been uh, built and added to and developed over the centuries, and it continues to be a very prominent site for Muslims to uh, attend to because this is, in fact, the location where Muhammad fled from Mecca and became his adopted city. Let me give you just a little bit of information that will kind of scope for you very briefly the life of Muhammad. In A.D. 619, his wife, Kaja, died. Up to this point, Muhammad had been um, purely monogamous. He had only one wife. And yet, within about a year of this event, the death of his, of his wife, he claims to have made a trip to heaven. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, again, within a year of the death of his wife, he claims that he was ordered by God to marry the daughter of his best friend Abu Bakir. At the time, that daughter, Aisha, uh, Islamic sources say, was six years old. Within another couple of years, the Hijra occurred, that is, his flight from Mecca to Medina because of the persecutions that were levied against him by his hometown tribe of the Quraysh. Consequently, the year A.D. 622 is a very critical, very prominent event in Islamic history. In fact, all of Islamic history, and therefore to a Muslim, all of world history, is dated from the Hijra, the flight from Mecca to Medina. In fact, as you read through the Quran, there are clearly surahs that pertain to events preceding the Hijra. 
So these are surahs that pertain to events in Mecca. And then you have other surahs that clearly indicate a post-Hijrah circumstance or context. And these are those that were uh, given during the period that Muhammad was in Medina. So the Quran has Meccan surahs and Medinan surahs for the most part. Now, once Muhammad shifted from Mecca to Medina, let me give you a very brief scoping of history at this point. He engaged in armed conflict with Jewish tribal groups that were living in Medina. Fascinating concept that as the Jews all the way back in Babylonian times, Babylonian captivity were dispersed. And right on down to the time of Christ centuries later, uh, there's indication in Acts chapter 2, for example, that Jews that came for Pentecost in the year A.D. 30 came from nations all over the world, and that included Arabia, according to Acts chapter 2. So these Jewish tribal groups were living in various parts, and there were a number of them living right there in Medina, probably been there for, for centuries, for generations. Who, therefore, they were Arabic in the sense that they had enculturated, but they were still a very Jewish, very monotheistic, well, when Muhammad presented himself to these Jewish individuals in hopes that they would understand that he saw himself as the logical sequel or the logical continuation of Judaism and Christianity and kind of the, uh, the post-occurrence of proper religion, uh, he hoped that the Jews would accept him as another prophet in this long line of prophets going all the way back to Adam. However, that was not to be. And consequently, conflict emerged and hostilities commenced between Muhammad and his followers and the Jewish tribal groups. In the meantime, there were other Arab groups that he had conflicts with because they were polytheistic. He was wanting them to submit to the notion of monotheism. And then you have the fact that his hometown tribe of Quraysh were not willing to allow him to leave unscathed. It's true that he had fled from their grasp but they wanted to rid themselves of him. They still had issues with him. And consequently, they would literally launch attempts to assassinate Muhammad. Also during this period, Islam continued to expand. More conversions were made. Muhammad's military strength was likewise increasing. And also I might point out that during this period, Muhammad began to add wives, add women, to his harem. And consequently, he would have another living quarters constructed adjacent to the mosque that was being built in Medina. And he claims during this period that he continued to receive revelations from Allah, the Arabic word for God. Moving down to AD 630, about eight years after his having fled from his hometown of Mecca, we find that he had achieved sufficient military strength that he was able to gather his military forces and march on his hometown of Mecca. At this point, he subjugated essentially the entire population. He purged the Kaaba of all of its polytheism and engaged in some other actions but for all practical purposes brought in under submission, which by the way is the meaning of the word Islam, submission. Notice the form of the same word, Islam, Muslim. Muslim, one who submits. So he brought under submission the population of Mecca, but he did not move in and begin to live there. He went back home to Medina, back to his adopted city. Within two years of his bringing Mecca under control, he returned for another pilgrimage that turned out to be the farewell, the final pilgrimage trip to Mecca. That was A.D. 632. And later that year, June 8th, at the age of 62, Muhammad died of what is essentially an unknown illness. Now that is a very brief recapping of the life of Muhammad to help us to be somewhat acquainted with this individual that has uh, occupied so much attention uh, over the last 14 or 1500 years. Now let me give you a very brief thumbnail sketch of Islam as it has manifested itself since the death of Muhammad. 
Remember now, Muhammad claimed to be a prophet of God. And therefore, he claims, and Muslims claim, that he was the quintessential prophet of God. He was the ultimate and final prophet of God. And so when he died in A.D. 632, the Islamic community was momentarily, shall we say, disoriented. It was quite a blow to them that the prophet would die so unexpectedly. And they were initially kind of uncertain as to what they were due. I don't believe there was any concern or thought about appointing a new prophet. They believed he was the last prophet. But they did feel that there needed to be a community leader, somebody who would lead or serve as a, as a proper authority among the Muslims. And so there immediately began to be discussion about, well, who should that be? And there was immediately a disagreement, of course about who should replace Muhammad. But this disagreement was uh, fairly quickly squelched. And Abu Bakr was selected, close friend of Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad had married his daughter. And consequently, Abu Bakr became the first Khalifa, the first caliph, sort of a deputy uh, vice regent. And he served in that capacity from the death of Muhammad to A.D. 634, at which time he was replaced by Umar, who was another very close associate of Muhammad, going back to the very beginning of Muhammad's uh, teaching and, and promotion of Islam. Uh, he served in that capacity for about a decade, and then at his demise, he was replaced by Uthman. Now, up to this point, we have uh, general consensus within the Islamic community on each of these individuals because they went right back uh, to the time of Muhammad. They were very prominent figures. Uthman served in that capacity for over a decade, about 12 years. But at this point in Islamic history, 656 A.D., the division, the seeds of which occurred right after the death of Muhammad, now came to a head. And the Islamic community essentially split apart into two primary factions. The first of these factions believed that the successor to Muhammad should be a blood relative, somebody directly linked back to Muhammad by blood. These individuals became known as Shiites because of the Arabic word Shia that has to do with being party to or partisan to. And so they selected Ali, who could trace his lineage back to Muhammad, and he became the first uh, Shiite Imam, that would be one of the terms that are, that's used by uh, Shiites to refer to their leaders. His two sons successively succeeded him, Hassan and Hussein. All individuals that agreed with that perspective, that the leader of the Islamic community should be connected directly to Muhammad, uh, they to this day are known as Imams or Ayahs. And you've heard of the Ayatollah, for example. Now, the other element in the Islamic community that disagreed with that view said, no, the community leader can be someone who is selected by community consent, somebody that the community recognizes as a suitable and appropriate leader. These individuals became known as Sunnis. And in fact, the majority of Muslims have gone this direction. And consequently, they selected their first leader, and then over the centuries, other uh, caliphs, sultans, sheikhs were selected to be the community leader of the Muslims, and, and they sort of set up what we might call dynasties, uh, caliphates, the Arabs would call it. And so there was the Umayyad Caliphate and the Abbasid, and, and this ultimately culminated in what we would call the Ottoman Empire, which had its center in Turkey. So the Ottoman Turks were kind of a, a climaxing of Islamic influence in art and architecture and and other areas of development. And for all practical purposes, the Ottoman Empire came to a close about the time of World War I. That is a very brief history of Islam in its political manifestations over the centuries. Now, let me comment very quickly on this major split that occurred between the Shiites and the Sunnis. I cannot overstate the significance of this division. 
It is very prominent in the minds of Muslims worldwide. There may be an attempt by the Muslim world to give the impression that, oh, we're all, we're all united, we all agree, unlike you Christians and other groups that are all fragmented. But the facts of the matter are this is a split of really rather catastrophic proportions. In fact, uh, many times when you hear even in Iraq and such places of warring and killing going on, many, many times it is a clash between the Shiites and the Sunnis, even if Westerners have come and somehow gotten involved in the fracas. Well, as it turns out, the Shiites went on to split many more times and to divide over various disagreements. The Sunnis have done the same thing. There have been many factions and many divisions and disagreements uh, over their thinking. A fellow came about probably a century or so ago by the name of Wahhabi. He was kind of a Puritan in his thinking. He believed in going back to what he called the golden age of Islamic history when it was purely Arabic. And consequently, he advocated warlike jihad, a viewpoint that is promulgated and championed by even the Saudi royal family. If I were to try to give you some sense worldwide of the Muslim population in terms of Shiite versus Sunni, here is how that would lay out. Uh, roughly 13 to 14 percent are Shiite whereas the rest are Sunni. So if we were to round in round numbers, about 90% of the population of Islam is Sunni, and therefore about 10% are Shiite. In our next session together, we will examine the question, why do radical Muslims hate Americans? And then we will turn our attention to the basic beliefs of Islam. What are their basic fundamental doctrines? What constitutes their overall belief system? If you appreciate this seminar on Islam and the Quran, you will want to read the book on which it was based, The Quran Unveiled. This volume gives a great deal of additional information not included in the DVD seminar. Also available are study guides that supplement your viewing of the DVD. The study guides, the book, as well as additional copies of the DVD may all be purchased at apologeticspress.org or by calling toll-free 800-234-8558. This has been a presentation of Apologetics Press, an organization dedicated to the defense of New Testament Christianity. Visit us on the web at apologeticspress.org or call 800-234-8558.